was dealing with, or I was about to deal with, the exchange of correspondence that occurs between uh, the, the two meetings. Can yes. I say immediately, just as I did, albeit in slightly different terms, in front of Mr. Justice Thornton today, that I adopt and accept my Lord Lord Justice Stuart Smith's proposition that this was a suboptimal exercise to go through. I, I said that below, and, uh, and her ladyship records that in the, in the judgment. It's not the best practice to use phrasing below. And that's right. But, but I want to be clear that I accept that. I'm not saying this was something that ought to be repeated generally. But I just want to um, take your lordship's relationship to a couple of the um, references, just, just to be, if for no other reason, just to be clear about what was going on. Um, the first place I made is um, the witness name of Kirsty Dougal. We haven't mentioned yet, which is at page 345 of the supplementary bundle. Yes. Um, now she, she says, <laughs> this, this just to be clear, that obviously this is a witness statement that was produced for the hearing. Um, and in paragraph six, in response to uh, something that solicitor and claimant and appellants, you know, she says, just make clear, and I'm paraphrasing, that the only uh, action she took was to send her first draft of the report to Mr. Holmes, her superior, copying her line manager, Sarah Hill Sanders. And that's it. She isn't involved in any further exchanges. She isn't copied in in the exchanges between Mrs. Holmes and Mr. McCrory. Uh, the one email from Cassie Sozin doesn't copy her in. She, as I said, <coughs> wishes to un downplay her involvement, but plays no further part in that exchange. <coughs> and and um, what then happens is dealt with by Mr. Holmes in his way. which is at page 349, so a few pages further on. Paragraph 4, he picks up the story. The draft report was forward, he means forwarded to me from the case officer, Kirsty Dugan, on 15th. I made some changes that I felt were appropriate to make clear to the committee the Office of Professional Views on the proposal and the options available to the committee in terms of application. And then he forwarded it to David Green, who's the head of planning, copying in an officer, I say, uh, copying in Councillor Sozin as chair of the committee, and Councillor McCrory as cabinet member in case they wish to make any comments. Now, the first point is that Councillor McCrory is a member but isn't a member of the planning committee. He, he plays no part in either of the two meetings. So the only member who does is Councillor Sozin, the chair. Right. <coughs> and and Councillor McCrory is is the mic referred to in Councillor Sazen's note, seventeen. So, um, and then. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, Councillor McCrory is the, the the cabinet member for what? For planning. For planning. Yes. Right. But not part. Not you say part of this committee. Not on the committee on either on either case. Whether, whether he's on the committee in the general sense, I, I just don't know. But he, he wasn't a member of either of the committees. Like whether the first meeting was the second meeting. Yeah. And then the emails themselves, I know we've been to them in some detail, but just to in a sense, draw all that um, together. The, the first one to look at is page 175 of the supplementary. I just want to make a few brief observations about what's going on here. All of them, the caveat that I made at the beginning that I don't think this is great practice. And so at 175. And it's not best practice because? Because uh, I think um, officers could have dealt with this themselves. I don't think they needed the, the chair. Um, and I don't think they needed Councillor McCrory. But uh, that's that's an observation, and, and I say that wasn't anywhere <coughs> near the ground ground to it, or, or indeed any sort of ground. Um, I think generally it would have been more sensible for officers who, who were there, perhaps to ask for legal advice or what advice implications of, of what had happened in terms of looking at the report. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> so, just what I was about to say, yeah, that's, 
ich kein Dance with Google Drive or with the changes to Dave Green. And he said he beefed up 1.3 and 1.4 and, and says, is this okay or do you want something more overt? Now, I just pause to say there's a suggestion in the um, Hellenic <coughs> Skeleton argument that that email or the language of do you want something more overt was from McDougall. Second point is that, for what it's worth, Councillor Sozin, copied in here, is the chair, but she's also somebody who voted to follow the officer's recommendation both times. So in the first meeting, she was on the side of following the officer's recommendation to refuse. And was also one of the ten But she is also the author <coughs> of the email on the page before, 174. I see my lady has the point. In fact, it's the point made this morning, which is her asking earlier in this email, the 17th of December, uh, quite what was going to happen. The president <coughs> will be, you'll be giving the reasons to approve as per our decision. It's part of Learn Friends case, but that rather indicates that, as I understand it, Sozin was of the view that they'd done rather more than just defer, as I understood the Learned Friends Group's opinion. <coughs> that, that document was useful. What, what I say is that it, in, in the context of open minds, it shows clearly that she had a, a mind both for and against. But, I, but I, can I say immediately that I endorse gratefully the observation, I think it was my Lord Lord Justice Phil Smith who made it, that there is nothing beyond Councillor Sozin. None of these emails go to any other member of the committee on either occasion. There's no suggestion that their contents <coughs> are passed on to anyone else. My learned, case, my learned friend's case just doesn't get any further than Councillor Sozin. Who but what they don't show is Councillor Sozin putting any pressure, improper or otherwise, on anyone, or no. make, even making a suggestion no. that the report be changed in any way. No. She starts by saying, um, uh, that rather assuming that what the planning officers are going to do are coming up with re reasons for approval, having herself voted against it. Yeah. Um, and that's what she's, that's her mindset. And then as a result of the passage of time and various other people putting input in, um, it, it, the, the report makes it clear that you don't have to re approve yes. it, you could still refuse. Yes, that's, that's quite but right. But that doesn't come from her at all, as I see yeah. it. No, indeed, none, none of the, e there's no further email from her until the one on, the on page 179 where she says, yes, I'm happy with that final version. Yeah. Um, the, the, the other exchanges are, are between um, officers, essentially. There's, there's one from Councillor McCrory to Mr. Holmes. Maybe there is one on <coughs> page 177, but it's, uh, and it's from Councillor Sozin, but it's squarely in the context of the procedural question, mm. not, not, the, not the merits of the work. I agree more emphasis on being able to go back to the recommendation to use Rawls for help. And then um, 177, <coughs> sorry, 180, Mr. Holmes then sends two possible versions of paragraph 1.6. <coughs> The, the procedural position. Councillor McCrory on that same page, page 180, says, I prefer the second shorter suggestion. But he, what happens, he's ignored, and it's the longer version that finds its way into the uh, second further report. But, um, I don't say any more about that. Final version is approved by Councillor, what is what's worked by Councillor Sosa's email on 179. <coughs> and Murphy made, or sought to make something of mention in a couple of the emails about reasons and whether they had been drafted or were expected to be drafted, but they hadn't ever seen them. Well, that question is dealt with by Ms. Dougal in her witness statement. The answer is that none were drawn up. She says that. Um, 
last last couple of places in the, in the tour. Um, page ninety three of the supplementary bundle is the green sheet. I don't think we've been there uh, yet. This is produced after the further report, but before the second meeting. Really in two parts. There's, a, there's an update about the progress of the enforcement appeal in respect of the unlawful use of part of that greenfield part of the land, which notes that the inspector <coughs> decision has been issued and time for compliance has been extended. And, and then the second part is a, is a verbatim setting out to the end of a representation that's been received. Additional representation from every person has been received. The representation says, and the remainder of the green sheet is, is that representation set out in full. And that, um, I don't think it's any um, secret that that, in fact, was from a Mr. Philpot who was in London, who was supportive of the officer's recommendation, didn't want. The only point I just highlight is right at the bottom of page 93, under two, he says, I can see no reference to the planning application plan which shows the actual, I repeat, actual in the CCC, terms of the county of adopted local plan, size of the rural employment zone. This is important, especially as several councils refer to the site being in the rural employment zone and a groundfield zone, not the case. And then he sets out the Figures which I um, mentioned at the start, albeit that his numbers are slightly wrong, but not, not so bad. So that is circulated to the councils in advance of the second meeting and to the applicants' planning committee. Then the, the second meeting, the transcript of which, sorry, the minutes of which that's for, are at 89. I'm going to come back to this, but it will be my submission, the second part of my submission on ground two. Second page of, that, of those minutes, page 90. In turn, the committee both acknowledge that there was a minded two decision on the previous occasion, had been minded to approve application contrary to the recommendation of officers, and had deferred. This is up halfway down. And grapples head on in the paragraph beginning, there was extensive discussion on the application with, with the change of view.
reconstructive of this question. One of the ways about one of the ways to attack or address the question of what was decided on the first occasion is could it could would time have started to run for a challenge to it? And my submission would be unless it was to the procedural nature of the decision, if it had somehow been contrary to the constitution or taken improperly, or then then plainly no challenge to the substance could possibly have been found from that. And then the second proposition, the second proposition related to, to that one is that in between a, a resolution to grant and the issue of a decision, a planning authority may, may change its mind. The resolution is not binding. And they can do that even where there's no material change in circumstances. That's a combination of Burkitt, again, and King's Cross, which is perhaps pivotal in this. The references of, paragraph, of King's Cross, which is paragraph 14, 1, and 20. But if they want to do so, change their mind, then they are subject to the requirement to grasp the intellectual nettle of the change of position in that single <coughs> So even where a planning authority does reach a concluded resolution to grant planning permission, which is not what we say happens here, but even where they do, they're not precluded from changing their mind at all. The only constraint on them in appropriate circumstances to, is to grapple or grasp the intellectual nettle of the change and its nature. And, and I say that because at times, although I think not today, my learned friend's arguments seem to veer towards saying that they were somehow bound to grant permission full stop. But I, I think my learned friend has argued that today, and the question is really, was the decision such that they had to grasp the intellectual nettle of the change? Um, second proposition is about the, the Constitution or the Code of Good Practice, as it's called, and I made the point earlier about that, that language. Um, it's at page 13 of the supplementary bundle. And the particular, I think the route to it is, is, um, is common ground, but uh, page 13 is, is the um, functions of the planning committee. And then page 14 is the requirement that in carrying out those functions, they shall operate in accordance with the code. That's 4.2.25.3. And then the code is where we find 5.2.7. And um, I just make the observation at the outset that in front of the learned judge, ground one of the claim was that um, council had, had misunderstood or failed to follow this constitutional requirement. Uh, and that was argued, and the learned judge came to a conclusion about what the constitutional provisions meant. And I, I don't detect any challenge to that in this appeal, so as to what they mean, not wanting to take a jurisdictional point, having expressed myself to be neutral on another one, that is the effect of, uh, as I understand it, non-appeal against the learned judge below conclusions about the meaning of the constitutional provision. Here, in this court, it's become about the meaning of the resolution, but below it's about the constitutional provision. And, and just briefly, um, our submissions, which I think are now clear, on what this means. The heading is a general heading, decisions contrary to officer recommendations. 
That is, decisions to grant where the recommendation is refused or to refuse where the recommendation is to grant. It's applied to both. And it's non specific as to what kind of planning application will be outlined in the paper. Mm -hmm. it, it's general. Next point, if the planning committee wants to make a decision, necessarily anterior to the making of the decision, I'd say it's in chronological terms or conceptual terms, prior to the making of the decision. And, and the first sentence taken as a whole, we say, is, is, a general is a general requirement. If the planning committee wants to make a decision on recommendation, the material planning reasons for doing so should be clearly stated, agreed, and limited. And I've also said that's really no more than a reflection of the common law uh, and statute. Statute says that if you refuse planning permission, you must give reasons. Common law has, a, sorry, statute has no <coughs> equivalent requirement for grants of planning permission, but common law, cases aren't in the authority of bundle, but they come in the case of Dover. Are, although there's no statutory requirement to give reasons for grants of planning permission, in certain cases, Common law will require the giving of reasons, one of which is, and, and it's case by case, but one of the pointers is a decision contrary to the recommendation. Uh, and that's, if I may say so, self evident because if you follow the recommendation of the officer's report, then the report is implied to be the reasons for the decision. Whereas if you fail to follow it or decline to follow it, then the, the reasons are at large. And then what follows is the uh, mechanism for dealing with that situation where it arises that the committee wants to make a decision contrary to the officer's report. And on plain words, as found by the learned judge below, the application should be deferred. And my first point is a, is a straightforward, perhaps homespun point, which is deferred means exactly that. It doesn't mean anything other than put off to another occasion. The application <coughs> they, they can't decide it there and then. It's a prohibition on doing so. There must be a deferral. And the deferral is for consideration of appropriate conditions and reasons and the implications of such a decision clearly explained in the report back. Conditions only arise where the proposition is an intended grant. There would be no requirement to consider conditions if this were the other kind of case where after the recommendation is approval, the intention was to refuse it. Reasons arises in both cases. And the implications clearly explained, in my submission, is a, is a wholly separate freestanding point, as recognised by Judge Below, then Judge Below, which points to exactly, I think my Lord Justice Holroyd said it this morning, exactly the point about breathing space. If you want to go against the recommendations of your professional officers, we pause, and the implications of Because the implications of doing so are different than are the implications of following an officer's recommendation. The chances of challenge are much higher. The ability to defend the decision is more difficult, at least in principle. And it, it's um, paragraph 39 and 40 in the uh, decision. Mr. Justice Thornton, uh, 
29G makes a point about sanction ordering convening. She then makes a point about 5272. And then at 40, she makes a point that I've just made and that I adopt. The claimant uh, was uh, the interpretation of 5.2.7.1, the last sentence implications. Uh, so don't work together. There would be no point in the second sentence, the second or third sentence, there would be no point in a report on the implications of the committee's decision if it had already been made. Accordingly, the purpose of the pause in decision making for consideration is to ensure that members have all the necessary information, including conditions, which in the circumstance of this case were not forgotten, given the officer's recommended refusal, and understand the implications of their proposed course of action and may subsequently come to their decision. In appropriate cases, the purpose may also be to ensure that the decision has been properly defended before it is pending appeal. There's only one reason for a provision of that nature, or only one context for it, which is that the decision can be reversed. The decision hasn't been taken and it can be different. The third proposition, or the third set of propositions, is that the committee were attempting to follow that constitutional apparatus, that constitutional power. The words that Councillor Roper uses when he proposes his motion are almost identical to that constitutional provision, minded to, and so on. And if I, if I may, I'll, I'll just posit a interpretation of minded to, because at points this morning it appeared that Learned Friend's case was that there were really only two points on the um, continuum, as it were, that mattered. Either the reasons for refusal were, any one of them was, was upheld or accepted, or if not, the principle was established and we go forward. But, but of course, there, there's a bit of space between them both, I think. You can be not persuaded by reasons for refusal, or not yet persuaded by reasons for refusal. So not yet reaching the point that you accept the principle of the application, but that the grounds on which you're being told you ought to refuse it have yet to persuade you that you should do so. I'm not saying that necessarily happened here. I don't need to for the purpose of my submission, but there is a continuum, and it isn't just those two points. The point is that as soon as the point is reached that there's a minded to, a crystallization of the minded to position, then that requires deferral. The stumps are drawn, take a pause or a breathing space, and do as Judge Slam did, and come back on another day. And, and um, that the committee were attempting to follow it and thought they were following the Constitution is underlined by the lack of any dissent, either in approving the minutes or having received a further report. Or when that same advice was reiterated at the start of the second meeting, not a soul said, hang on a minute, I thought we'd already had decided. And in fact, on page 99 of the supplementary binder, which is the transcript of the second meeting,
first person who was not of that mind was the first meeting with Councillor Frascone. So the first councillor who was in favour of granting planning permission speaks at 99. And she doesn't say, hang on a minute, I thought we'd decided this. And she might well have, because she was in the majority of It's interesting, it's interesting she uses the word I'm still minded to, to support the development. Yes. E even then, of course, she hasn't made up her mind. But when it comes to the vote, Councillor Frascona votes again in the same. She's the one in the 10 1. She describes the conditions, she looks at the conditions. Yes. Yeah, her position That's is still this, insane, though. Yeah, this is a good application. It replaces something that's harmful. We get affordable housing. I'm in favour. Yeah, broadly. And, and she's the one that votes for it. So far. But my, my point is, and I think I've made it already, is that if there were any confusion in the minds of anyone about what happened on the first occasion, it would have come out in her speech at that time and in subsequent. In fact, the contrary. Fourth proposition, really a development of that same world. Um, nothing that I have said or will say resiles from or steps away from the fact that it was clear that at the first meeting the majority wanted to grant planning permission contrary to what they said. That was where they got to eight of them. And, and that is, of course, the essential context for where they got to. Had that not been true, I can't get away from it. But the Constitution prohibited them, prohibited them from doing so, and they knew that. And then fifthly, and I think this is probably passably clear now, but in case it's not, I'll, I'll just say these things. The, the decision on the was a decision, undoubtedly, a decision to defer. The real question is the nature of that decision and its legal effect. A procedural decision, we say, but one which didn't limit the diaries of the <coughs> when it came back on the, the 12th of January. It was a decision that paused. Related to that, and I'm just mindful of my Lord, your Justice Stuart Smith's comments on granting permission. This hasn't been canvassed yet by Bishop Panther, if I may, or Thames Panther's point about interested parties. My, my Lord made the observation in granting permission that um, if no decision had been made, why then were interested parties excluded from making comments on the second meeting? I'm, I'm not expressing it in any way as elegant. It's at page two. In my judgment, there seems also to be a potential difficulty arising from the terms of the Constitution, the judge's conclusion that no decision at all is made. If that's right, it's hard to understand why interested parties are not allowed to address the committee at the open meeting, despite two material changes. Um, in the then the judge's decision, judgment. Paragraphs 22 to 23, and it sets out a summary, and it's an accurate summary, of exchanges with interested parties, small i, small p, between the first and second meeting. And I, I go here only because it, it gets confusing, because the, the claimant and appellant here is not the accurate. Planning application, and so was a small i interested 
his agent was drowned, was, was sent the green sheet and was initially told on page 124 that there's no opportunity to speak at this time. <coughs> That's the email uh, from Chester Dougal in the second half of <coughs> of Mr. Philpott's interject interjections. Exactly.
to necessarily flow into one another. So you know, it may be that we need to say a little more about, about it. But again, uh, we adopt, but the reasoning of the uh, judge, uh, paragraph 49, as to the question of grasping the intellectual nettle that the decision on the first appeal required us to see it. Um, <coughs> what was decided? In St. Albans, I'm paraphrasing considerably, the question at last was a, the treatment of a previous decision by the Secretary of State on a materially similar application. So not, not a, nothing uncertain about it, nothing conditional. It was a final decision by the Secretary of State on a planning application. And one can see that from, from paragraph 25 to 28 of the judgment of Mr. Justice Holgate. Which paragraph? Uh, one well, starts with about what, 25. Oh, this, they're talking about King's Cross, so that's my note is wrong. Paragraph 1 sets out the decision under challenge, which is a decision to grant the planning commission for strategic rail freight in the city. has been the subject of two planning applications. The first was made in 2006 and refused. Public inquiry sat in November and December 2007. Main issue, the inspector <coughs> produced a report. Uh, and then there's seven. The Secretary of State's decision on the first appeal was issued on the 1st of October, broadly agreeing with the inspector's conclusions and accepting the recommendation to dismiss the appeal. So the, the previous decision, the intellectual nettle on which needed to be grappled with or grant, Secretary of State decision to refuse planning. Complete with reasons and an officer's report, sorry, an inspector's report, which was followed. Uh, King's Cross which is tab 2 The previous decision was a resolution to grant planning commission subject to section 106. So we say one step further along the process of deciding applications, but some time in the in the past. A, a period of time has passed between um, that, that resolution and the decision. Paragraph 7, page, page 27. Thank you. Having considered all of the arguments, the subcommittee resolved <coughs> the conditional outline planning commission should be granted, subject to referral.
refer of the application to the Secretary of State and the Mayor of London and the completion of the Section 106 agreement. And the Secretary of State and the Mayor confirmed that there was no cause. So that was perhaps one rung lower down in the hierarchy of concluded planning decisions. And the resolution was granted subject to Section 106, which is more or less one rung leads to the head of the decisions that are confirmed to appear. And North Wiltshire, which is often the source of the proposition about grafting the method on previous decisions, in that case, I don't take your worship to be contesting that that was about previous appeal decisions by the Secretary. Again, with the point I make is that what happened in all of those cases was the very thing that was prohibited by the Constitution from happening in this case. And it did not happen. And just a final tailpiece on that point. The idea of a requirement to grasp the intellectual nettle of disagreements over past decisions necessarily requires engagement with the reasons for that past decision. Why was that made? And in all of those cases, we've got that. But in this case, we haven't. Well, that was one of the reasons I asked the question that I did, which is I'm assuming that you have a decision to reject the planning officer's recommendations. The Constitution says you've got to give reasons, you've got to spell them out, and there aren't any. And you can't infer them from the minutes. So how do you... Where's the net? Yes. Yeah. Quite so. And of course, my lady, my lady friend stops short rightly in saying, well, you can look at the transcript for the reasons. Well, he can't do that because of cross. No, of course he can't. So there isn't a nettle, if I can put it that way. Yeah. But if I'm wrong, the second part of my proposition on ground two is that they did grapple with the implications of the first meeting. And I'll just show you some references that make that clear. They're all in the transcript of the second meeting. And we start on page 99 of the supplementary record. And I took your lordship to your lordship a short while ago to the office of Councillor Frascona. The next person to speak is Councillor Shaw. He picks up the point that's in the... on the green sheet. My lady is ahead of me. Yeah. Well, I had it underlined while you were going through it. So you've got something new, which wasn't there at the first meeting, which is that it has been pointed out that, contrary to the way in which it was presented before, this isn't just Brownfield or existing employment site, but at least half of it, or around about half of it, is Greenfield. And that seems to have swayed Councillor Shaw and also Councillor Ayres. Two steps ahead of me. Quite so. And I want to be careful about this, because that site was a mixture of colloquially Greenfield countryside. It was before the committee at the first meeting. That was in the officer's report. The officer's report was a diligent description of that. But what doesn't seem to have landed was the relative proportion of each. Yes. And that did land, at least with Councillors Shaw, Ayres, and Hyland, when they read Mr Philpott's point in the green sheet, which I took a moment ago. OK. 
Chancellor Shaw at 100, Chancellor Ayres at the bottom at 100. So, so Chancellor Shaw was um, in the majority yeah. first time round, changed his mind. Chancellor Ayres abstained the first time round, was in the majority the second time round. And she says, I hope that I can be convinced this is the right decision for 103. But on reflection, I don't feel the conditions are compelling enough to overturn our local plan. Only just been approved. Not a couple of houses at 65. Other councillors have raised points like the overhead line, the fact that we occupy Greenfield site, and based on that, my mind is not in support of the So she changes her mind and explains why. Councillor Highland is the next one who voted in the majority the first time. Page 101. Yeah, he's changed his mind. He changes his mind and explains why. That's the missing map, which shows the 4.5 acres of greenfield land that we've been committing to development. Now, I want to be careful. I'm not done suggesting that these were necessarily good or sound or decisions that we should come to. I don't need to. But they are grappling with the change of mind, head on. And then Councillor Ashley comes in on page 105, and, and she says, about half of she sees the, the next one because there's a bit of technological glitching going on in the meantime in such cases. Um, which rather interferes with Mr. Cancer Lee's comment. Um, he's a refuse, refuse. He's not a mind changer. So Cancer Ashley is the next one. She says, Yeah, Madam Chair, yes, uh, I'd like to support the offers this time. And at the bottom of 105, as the green sheet we had to happen was quite enlightening. And I feel that after the inspector's decision as well, that's the decision on the enforcement scheme that, that confirmed that the, that the unlawful activity would be brought to an end, albeit three months later than um, originally required to by the enforcement scheme. And the other point, as in loss of country property, so that's my point. So again, she says this. Now, as it happens, that, that's it in terms of councillors. But the other ones who um, voted in the majority the first time, Councillor Hughes abstains because she turns up late to the second meeting. So she said, for reasons unconnected to the substance, I'm not going to vote on this because I missed the beginning of the meeting. She, she's, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, she originally says, I'm going to vote again. Councillors who actually switched their votes in a positive <coughs> way, all, yes. all of them have explained why. Yes. And it's generally by reference to the um, Greenfield uh, and the de proposed development on that. Yes. There are other points. There are other points, that but that's, that's, a common that's a common connection. And just to complete the point, minutes, which are the focus of my learned friend's attack here, in terms of what's missing, what went wrong, summarises that exact position. There are 
page 90. Supplementary bundle. Well, page 89 where they say. Under number six, cite it actually. The first paragraph deals head on with what happened at the first meeting, acknowledges that they were minded to approve but defer. So, my friend says, no grappling with the point of change. Well, there's the first acknowledgement of this. Then, reference to the green sheet, and then this paragraph, which, again, I don't want to read it out, but just paraphrase. in the transcript. Several members who had expressed the view at the previous meeting that they should be granted said that having seen the matter further now the opposite view. The reasons varied, including precedent, adequate reasons, and the development of the encroach on greenfield land. Other members didn't change their mind. And then the resolution. So what's what's missing? Well, I think the only thing that's missing is a formal recording of the importance of keeping your consistency. Yes, and can I say up front that I accept that's not there, but there is no no proposition in any of the cases that says that that must be there in form rather than in substance. Yeah. And, and the form is irrelevant if the substance is there, and the substance is amply there. In recognising in the first paragraph that there has been a change in and in the third paragraph, by explaining. <coughs> the importance of the principle is recognised and given proper deference by complying with the duty to grasp the message. It's substance, not form.
is also my last point, which is that the most you could say, even if you were to assume that the chair had a closed mind, there's nothing to show that any of the others did. Quite so. Quite the opposite. Quite so. Yeah. Yeah. I don't place to go into all 12 points. No. Um, I've done that in a number of places in the bundle. There's an answer.
Thank you very much indeed. Yes, Peter. Well, just some brief points by way of reply, really in the order that my learned friend developed his submissions. Uh, looking at the Constitution, first, in May, the supplemental bundle, page 16. It's a point that harks back to whether at the conclusion of the first meeting there was a form of decision beyond a procedural deferral or not. And I simply invite attention to this feature of the Constitution. At 5.2.7.2, there is a restriction that only those members of the committee present at both meetings can vote on the reason for the decision, uh, should that come to be decided upon. Uh, it, it is not easy to see, in terms of administrative law, <coughs> what the purpose is of that restriction if the situation is that in the first meeting there is no decision of any substance at all. It is simply a matter of a preliminary view. Well, my reaction would be quite the contrary. That if you've got a binding decision at the first one, it doesn't matter who turns up to the second one. Right. Well, well it, on our analysis, what am I missing? It, if if there is no substantive decision being made on the first occasion, then there is no reason to seek to ensure that there is over. Yes, sir. Is you want continuity? Yeah. You want the decision only to be taken by people who've been there throughout. But, well, that, that is more important, I say, in circumstances where we, we know that they can't grant the application at the first meeting because they don't have the conditions, for example, before them. So they're not going to be able to complete the process. But they can start the process. And it's the fact that they've started the process and taken the first decision along the steps which requires then the conditions, for example, to be drawn and contemplated, that shows why it is important to have the same group of individuals, and certainly in terms of the voting, uh, the same group of eligible individuals, on the second occasion, if, if nothing of any substance is being done on the first occasion. No, but, 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 but with respect, Mr. Brigham, um as we've seen in this case, um, the representations were made at the first meeting and further representations aren't going to be allowed or at any rate are going to be severely limited. No oral representations, etc. Um, so speaking for myself, that seems at least one good reason why you want the same decision makers. You don't, you don't swap for members of the jury halfway through their deliberations. Yeah, or, or on, on the basis of that, there has been a step along the way to a final decision, and therefore it's important to keep the constitution of, of the decision makers as, 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 just as, as far as you can. It's just that they've heard half the argument. Yeah. There's certainly no step along the way if it's a jury. <coughs> well, the, 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 I, I understand your point, but... Um, <laughs> The, the, the step along the way may not necessarily involve the, the making of any decision, either an actual decision or a decision in principle or anything. It may just be a simple procedural matter. If you've had two hours of going through the, the representations, which is not going to be repeated, it would seem quite a bad idea to allow people who've just popped in halfway through the second stage to um, contribute to the vote. Well, but that's the way I'd put the point, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd say the importance of it is that it's a process in motion. Yeah. Uh, in relation to the uh, second report, a point was made, fairly made, that the second report, whilst it doesn't have any draft reason for approval, does set out the conditions. Mm. But what it doesn't do, and, and again, uh, I invite a short review with the other um, similar reports within the bundle, what it doesn't do is contain any discussion about those conditions, their likely acceptability, and so on. And again, for the reasons that I developed earlier, we say that 
that's important when the prime elements of the discussion ought to have been conditioned in Section 106. <laughs> so that is another notable feature, we say, of that second report. Uh, in relation to the minutes of the second report, so, sorry, the, the minutes of the second decision at page 90 of the supplemental bundle, the, the point has been made uh, by both of us that in relation to the transcripts, what the transcripts can't do because of cross is provide the reasons for the decision. So insofar as one looks for satisfaction of the North Wiltshire test, then because that needs to come from the reasons of the decision, that needs to come from the minutes rather than the transcripts that are available in relation to the second meeting. On that basis, and I accept two things about this. First, there is no magic form of words that needs to be used in relation to the second uh, man requirement. And I accept that it's a matter of substance and not form. Uh, both those things being said, what I say you cannot detect from the minutes of the second meeting is a, a freestanding recognition in any form of words of the value of consistency itself. And that is one of the two limbs of the test. In relation to the grasping of the intellectual nettle, uh, my little friend says, well, well, what nettle is there to grasp in the absence of there being um, clear uh, minutes drawn up showing reasons for the deferral. In, in relation to that, the, the court has a submission I made earlier that, that it would be a, a, a very odd outcome of the application of the consistency process for a planning authority's position to be advanced by the fact that it had to comply with a necessary part of its constitution in that respect. But also, uh, just some references to take away in relation to the King's Cross case and the pointer that was given there and, and in the St Albans case about consideration of whether or not there are good reasons for a departure, for a change and in both cases the court was at pains to point out that the good reason formulation is not a test of law but it's a recognition of the practical reality that if there has been a decision or a view taken at an earlier point in time in relation to a planning application, then in order to justify the change, there does need to be, normally, a good reason. And the cases give examples of how that good reason can arise. But surely you're not submitting that it wouldn't be a good reason to say, oh, we didn't realise the first time round that the implications were that you'd be building on a lot of green, greenfield land. My, my lady, I, I wouldn't make that submission if it were um, clear that there had been a substantial misunderstanding in that respect. And, and one of the reasons that the position here is not as straightforward as one would wish is that it seems that the green sheet that was supplied to the committee was uh, controversial to a degree, and, and the court has seen what Mr Hopkins wrote about the timing of the production of the green sheets and the limited ability, uh, both on behalf of the interested party, to respond to it, and also in relation to Mr Blacker. It's not clear that Mr Blacker saw the green sheet before um, the second meeting at all. But what we do have in the papers is a later letter that was generated. Excuse me, I'll just find the reference. <coughs> Which addresses uh, this issue. And if we look at pages 131 and 132 of the supplemental bundle, <coughs> what we can 
can see there is a letter from 9th of February 2021 to Mr. Hopkins from the planning agents, uh, and simply to observe that having not had, as it were, uh, the opportunity to respond fully in writing to the green sheet, on page 132, under point two, second paragraph down from there, paragraph indicating that in fact uh, the, the extent to which there's development on undeveloped open space <laughs> may have been controversial the measurements that were given, but I accept that that repost, as it were, was not before the committee at, at the time. Uh, what is not clear, bearing in mind that, as my learned friend accepts, the first officer report did address this issue, the extent to which the level of change to really uh, support the idea that there was a good reason for the change. But I accept that, that plainly um, within the transcript, some of the councillors relied upon that. The, the minute is less clear, I would submit, in that respect. And it is really uh, vague in relation to the basis upon which uh, the members were changing their minds doesn't have the level of specificity that would uh, easily demonstrate good reasons for a change of mind. One of the points uh, that was addressed was what minded to means where it arises uh, within uh, resolutions, what it means when it arose in this particular case. And Mr. Cannon fairly says that he's not suggesting in this case there was some, some third option like the, the deferral that, that I mentioned earlier due to a, a need for further information. In this case, when we look at the transcript, we look at the way that the issue was being approached, the choice was between approve so far as we can at the moment or refuse. And so I simply um, rehearse that point. The point was, was made about Councillor Fresco, Fresco, of course, at the second meeting, if the state of affairs is that there is one remaining councillor who is articulating a case in favour of the proposal and is following three uh, individuals who have already expressed uh, a, a negative case against it, then in light of an officer report, which sets out in section one, all options are open and so on. Councillor Frascona would have presumed that was put together with the benefit of legal assistance. Then it may be seeming to uh, place a lot of weight on her shoulders and, and to draw any inference from the fact that the one person who is still minded to vote in favour that doesn't pipe up at that stage and say, well, didn't we decide something important in relation to this at an early <coughs> meeting? One can see that in other circumstances, but Come perhaps... They're grown know, up. They're grown ups, and this is a grown up committee. If, well, if I mean, if your responsibility as a committee member, if you think something's going seriously wrong, is yeah. to speak up. And we, you can't ask to spe us to speculate that there was a silent misery going on. My Lord, I, I, I say that it's placing a, a lot of emphasis on the inaction of one individual in circumstances where. It is not uncommon for members to, to listen respectfully to debate and not necessarily take part and, and then vote at the conclusion of the debate. So that's uh, what I say in relation to that. One more reference in relation to the authorities, and it's to address the point that my own friend makes about cases like uh, St Albans where there's a previous Secretary of State's decision letter supported by an inspector's report, uh, contrast with the King's Cross case, whereas the learned friend accepts that that was only one rung further forward from where we are now with a, a, a resolution that was closer to fruition. But if one goes to paragraphs 91 and 92 of the St Albans decision, what you will see there expressed is the idea that the principle of consistency is capable of a broad spectrum of different cases, uh, as 
says must be right. And one of the kinds of case, indeed the, the first kind of case that Mr. Justice Holgate identified, is the kind of case that involves the same land, similar or the same proposals, and so on. And so uh, there is, in terms of the principle of consistency, a number of factual features of this case which indicate uh, that it uh, ought to be brought into play. It's never in any reported decision, so far as I'm aware, ever been brought into play in the case of a, a provisional decision, one way or the other, which hasn't actually been definitively um, determined, subject to the um, provision of further information. Well, my lady, that's uh, correct as, as far as... So it would actually be um, pushing the envelope if we were to say the principle of consistency applies in a case like this, even on your analysis. But my lady, it would be consistent with the overarching purposes yeah. of, of what consistency is seeking to achieve. Uh, and there is, uh, we would say, no, no principle basis for uh, allowing the example that exists for, for example, in King's Cross, and saying that in this case there is no room for the application of the principle of consistency, if I'm right about the nature of the decision that was taken on the first occasion. If that is right, then uh, why is it uh, a substantial extension of the principle to say that those who are reviewing or revisiting that resolution should not uh, pay attention to the fact that very, in the very recent part, a number of their colleagues considered the matter in detail and came to a conclusion on it. Well, it depends on the nature of the conclusion. If the conclusion was um, final conclusion, which all of, all of the decisions, the reported decisions, are about final conclusions on same or similar land, um, if it's a final conclusion and you're being asked to re re revisit a final conclusion, I can see the point. If it's provisional, then ex hypothesize everything's up for grabs. So what is there to be consistent about? Well, the, the, it's the still written in water, isn't it? Well, Lady, I, I say no for the reasons I, I developed earlier. But in relation to the King's Cross case, it, it is worth perhaps bearing in mind that in that case it was a resolution. And it was a resolution initially subject to two other potential decision makers <coughs> looking at it, mm. as well as the potential for a section 106 to be completed, and that's why the matter went back to the committee at a later stage for consideration of the section 106. Yeah. <clears throat> and so what uh, we say uh, here is that if that principle is engaged, then despite my letter friend's submissions, what as a matter of substance rather than form has still not emerged from is a clear recognition of the importance of the principle of consistency. And so to that extent, um, we say that the appeal ought to succeed. Um, I don't trespass further in relation to ground three. I've de developed those arguments this morning. And you have Mr. Cannon's response. Well, may I just turn around? Mm. <coughs> My Lord, unless I can assist, that's all I was proposing to say. Just, um, just so that I'm clear, um, Mr. Cannon, right at the end of his submissions, um, made a point about the remedy you were seeking. Um, do, you, do you want to say anything about that, or do you want to, to narrow the scope of the remedy you're seeking? Well, Lord, in, in relation to the remedy itself, uh, I accept that the most the court can do is what? Yes. Uh, but what I would observe is that depending on any findings the court makes, there could be, for example, a set of findings that says, well, in fact, uh, what happened at the first meeting wasn't simply written water. There was a decision at that stage. What ought to have happened under the Constitution, if it was functioning correctly, are those residual matters relating to conditions in Section 106. And there was never any question relation to either of those matters. And all of those things could be recorded if those are the findings of the court. Mm -hmm. 
All right, thank you very much indeed. We'll, we'll just rise very briefly to just to consider where we're up to.
and Mr. Begg and Mr. Cannon, um, our thanks to, to both of you for your very helpful submissions orally today and to those behind you for their part in uh, ensuring the case has been so well presented. We're very, very grateful to you all. You'll not be surprised to hear that we will reserve our decisions. Um, <clears throat> in, in due course, we will circulate a, a draft of the uh, judgment or judgments. The purpose of that, uh, as usual, will simply be for the parties to help us to identify any typographical errors or obvious mistakes, getting names the wrong way around, that, that kind of thing, uh, not for further argument. And in that um, regard, could each of you please ensure that my clerk has a copy of the appropriate distribution list for the, the draft judgment? You'll be, be well aware of the uh, recent issues which have arisen in one or two cases about uh, inappropriate um, <coughs> distribution of the draft. Um, thereafter, we will aim to <coughs> hand down the decision in the uh, now familiar remote procedure so that nobody will need to attend for any further hearing. When we circulate the draft, we'd be grateful if you would please liaise to try to agree uh, an order. If there is any consequential matter which you can't agree between yourselves, could each of you please make brief written submissions to identify the issue and we'll decide whether uh, either further written submissions or a further short hearing. Unless there's anything you think we've failed to cover, that's, I think, as far as we can take it today. No, no, no. Very, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you.